Okay, yeah, we're live now, so. Uh. All right, they're all coming in right now. So. Okay, wait. <clears throat> Okay, I think we'll get started. Is that okay. sure? Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope you all got a chance to get outside tonight. Today it was nice, right? <laughs> um, um, welcome to both uh, those in the class and those watching us on YouTube. Um, please ask questions and make comments in the chat in either place, and um, I'll do my best to moderate uh, those questions afterwards. Um, next week's lecture is actually a performance um, called My Body is Opaque. Um, this is with Stefani Jemison and Alexis Page, and it's part of the Syracuse Symposium. Um, I want to thank Marty Blake for helping to bring Bernard Lee as our guest tonight. Um, I really appreciate her work on that. Um, and we're very happy to welcome back to Syracuse Bernard Lee. Um, Lee received his BFA in illustration from Syracuse University. Um, he then worked for a few years as an art director at Scientific American in New York, and he now lives in California, um, 
working as an illustrator and painter for the publishing, editorial, and entertainment industries, and also private collector, collectors. Some of Lee's uh, clients include Scientific American, Macmillan, Vice Media, uh, Image FX, Rockstar Games, and Variety Magazine. He's received awards from the Society of Illustrators in New York, as well as Society of Illustrators in Los Angeles, American Illustration, and Infected by Art. Um, Lee's paintings take us into the worlds of fantasy, history, and sci-fi, as well as portraiture. I'm very happy to introduce Bernard Lee. Take it okay. away. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, uh, everyone, for inviting me into your class today. Um, should I just go ahead and share my screen? Please. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Um, Thank you to Joanna for coordinating today's today's talk. Um, thank you to Marty Blake for the invites and to Bob Dacey, my old professor, uh, for having a chance to speak to his class just a little bit earlier. Uh, that was a really fun, uh, fun experience. Um, let me see here. Let me go ahead and start this full screen up. Everyone can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so as Joanna mentioned, I did graduate from Syracuse University in 2011. Um, I was an illustration major, but uh, I thought that, you know, for today's talk, I would uh, use this as an opportunity to um, kind of quickly go through just basically my entire life uh, in very um, quick uh, slides here. Um, I feel like the most relevant information that I could probably share with you is uh, how I got my starts. And so we'll, we'll kind of quickly shuttle on to that stage of my, of my life. Um, and I think what you're going to see from this slideshow is that uh, my, my particular path was what I consider to be a very unusual one. Um, I think when you hear a lot of people uh, talk, they all, they all have very unusual paths to which they ended up where they uh, ended up getting. And, uh, you know, we, we all kind of set out on our journeys, uh, expecting to follow a particular path, perhaps. And uh, there's a lot of things that happen in life that are thrown our way that kind of change our course a little bit or our obstacles. And I just wanted to use today as an opportunity to share how I sort of manage those obstacles and how I ended up where I am today. So I'll go ahead and start with my early years. I was born in 1989 and I graduated high school in 2007. Um, but before we get to high school, um, I was, uh, when I was very, very young, uh, my parents very wisely, I think, exposed my brother and I to a really wide range of different types of activities. Um, Literally every single day we were doing every single day after school and on weekends, we were doing something. We were doing martial arts. We were doing baseball, basketball, you know, soccer. We were doing cup scouts. We would go skiing in the winter. We were taking piano lessons and doing all these things that were, you know, designed to keep us busy and hopefully learn something a little bit useful. Uh, I ended up realizing that or learning very quickly that I didn't really like any of those things. Uh, so despite my parents' best effort, none of those things that they introduced me to really interested me. Um, and uh, so here's a picture of, for example, of uh, me and my dad on a ski trip. And my mom took the photo so we can clearly see who I get the composition gene from. So a nice, interesting composition there. But I was exposed to what I didn't really know at the time was called illustration. And this was, this was completely done through a children's book. And so for a long time in my childhood, when I thought of the word illustration, I just, I only thought of children's book illustration. That was the only way that, that the term was applicable. And so I was, you know, I read, you know, all the magic school bus books. Uh, my dad one day brought home about 20 or 30 hardcover novels called uh, The Great Illustrated Classics. And these are just like uh, classic novels that were sort of translated down into simpler language for children to be able to, to understand. 
but every single one of these books had these beautiful, you know, paintings on them, beautiful illustrations. And of course, like many uh, children my, my, of my particular generation, we, we grew up on Harry Potter. The Harry Potter books came out first when I was in elementary school and finished my senior year of high school. So it was just a nice um, kind of accompaniment to, to grow up with. But um, despite all of these books that I was reading, I was a voracious reader when I was a kid, especially picture books. There was really only one book series that really made a tremendous impact on me in my early development as what I would eventually turn out to be. And that was Dinotopia by James Gurney. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Maybe some of you have even read this. I'm, I apologize for the very low res image here, but it was the best quality that I could find. But I'm sure many of you have at least heard of this. Uh, if not, I, I implore you to check out this book. Um, this book came to me at just the right time in my life. I was about six or seven, and my mom was, you know, she didn't let us really play a lot of video games or, you know, go to the movies or anything like that. Um, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. So those, those were a little bit cost prohibitive for my family, but she had no problem going to the library and just renting or renting, borrowing tons and tons and mountains of books for us because there was no, you know, limit to the number of books that we could pour through. And one of the books that she brought home for me was Dinotopia. And I fell in love with this book. This book was exactly what I was into at that moment. I was, I loved dinosaurs and I loved picture books and I wasn't quite, you know, developmentally, I wasn't quite a good enough reader to be able to read through the text, but the imagery in this, in this book and in the series is just absolutely outstanding. So here are a couple of the illustrations from the interiors from various books in this series. Um, I fell in love with this book so much that uh, when it came time to return the book, I actually hid it from my mom. And so my mom couldn't find it. And so she ended up, you know, having to pay the, the fee for whatever, you know, it cost to, to buy the book from the library. But, um, but I stole the book. That was the first thing I ever stole in my life, essentially. Um, but going back to the artwork, um, so being about six or seven years old, I remember thinking that the work in this book is unlike anything I'd ever seen before. I, I hadn't really gone to any museums up to that point in my life. So I didn't really studied classical painting, obviously, but this was my first exposure to it. And even at like six years old or seven years old or however, I, however old I was at the time, I I, I could look up close to the printed images here and I could see something interesting going on. I, I distinctly remember thinking that it was weird that in some of these paintings, I could actually see the pencil, uh, the pencil line poking through to the final painting because, you know, if, if you know anything about James Gurney's painting style, he paints very transparently. He does a, a really nice drawing underneath and paints in thin and opaque coats. I didn't know this at the time, of course, but I just noticed it. And I think at that time, it, the, the seed was already planted that this notion that oil painting and illustration uh, is entirely just an optical illusion. It is a trick of the mind that you put this mud next to one another. And when you step back, it becomes a coherent image that we understand and can comprehend, uh, which which I don't think I would have been able to put it in those words at six, but in retrospect, I think that's what I was thinking. So I set off on my journey to learn how this was done. Uh, and this was my first uh, published illustration. This was my sixth grade yearbook. Um, and uh, there was a call for art to be submitted in the back of the page or back of the yearbook rather. And so I submitted my work thinking that that's what was going to happen, that, I, that if they accepted it, it would be in the back of the book. But lo and behold, the book is printed and distributed. And I got my first illustrated cover at sixth grade. They didn't pay me, of course. So, you know, I, I, I do have to follow up with them about that. But nonetheless, this was a, an interesting moment in my life. Um, 
you know, around this time, my mom eventually did sign me up for art classes. And I mentioned before that we had, she, she had signed me up for a lot of different extracurricular after school events, and I didn't like any of them. But this was the first time that, according to my mom, this was the first time that I asked her, when are we going back to art classes? And so she knew that there was something about this that I enjoyed. Another major milestone or my major experience in my life was going to the Getty Museum here, where nearby where I live here uh, up in LA. And I remember being very bored at that museum, uh, as, as many kids generally are when they go to a, a museum filled with stuffy old paintings. But there was this painting by uh, an artist named Sir Lawrence Almatadema, and it's called Spring. And this is located at the Getty Museum. And I remember looking at this painting and having a very, very similar uh, reaction to this particular painting as I did with uh, the way I felt with James Gurney. I mean, the same thing. I could look up close at it and I could see those pencil marks again. And that thought of painting being some sort of a magic trick or an illusion uh, that, that you know, was something that was starting to formulate and really be reinforced in my mind. Um, and so this is one of my favorite paintings. Um, this was the first time I looked at, a, at something, at anything really in my life. And I looked at that thing and I said, whatever this is that I'm beholding with my, you know, whatever that I'm experiencing right now, um, this to me seems like an impossibility. The fact that a human being made this thing. It was something that I couldn't comprehend. Now, I know I don't I didn't have that feeling when I was walking around the Getty Center, which if you've ever been to the Getty Museum here in LA, you'll know how beautiful the architecture is. I didn't have that feeling of impossibility looking at these amazing buildings, but for some reason I did with this particular painting. And so that made me very curious. Um, I didn't, I don't necessarily think that I set out to want to accomplish this impossible goal or anything like that, but it made me curious to want to learn more about it at the very least. And so here's some more of uh, Sir Lawrence Almatadema's work. He's one of my favorite artists. Um, and I specifically love his work because of the strong co composition, the unusual compositions. Uh, I mean, if you kind of look at these pictures, what I feel like I see is classical painting techniques laid on top of a very, very modern composition. These are very unusual. And um, I just, I still draw inspiration from these types of compositions to this day. What I didn't realize at six was that these two uh, art, you know, objects, uh, the book and the painting, they actually have a significant amount in common in that James Gurney was clearly heavily influenced by Sir Lawrence Almatadema. I mean, if you look at these two pieces, it's uncanny. Um, and so I realized how, I mean, I didn't realize for many years, but, you know, in retrospect, it's, it's quite, it's quite interesting to me that these two you know, things that I encountered on separate occasions then had very profound experiences with have this connective tissue. And I didn't realize it at the time, but only now do I realize that. And so these were some of my early art influences um, very, very early on. And so here are some earlier attempts. Uh, I believe this was either in middle school or maybe early high school. Um, doing some master studies. Uh, this is uh, by uh, a painter named Artemisia Gentilici. It's a self-portrait. And I tried to emulate that with colored pencil because I had no idea how to do an oil painting. And so I remember my dad being pretty impressed, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, and then here's another one by uh, Winslow Homer. This, this painting hangs up in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And when I actually, much later on in life, got to go to that museum and walk into the room and see this painting, 
it kind of blew my mind because obviously I was very familiar with it, having seen it and studied it from the, you know, for the study, but I had no idea when I walked into the museum that it would be there. And so I just kind of soaked it all in and then went back and looked at my, my previous watercolor attempt on the left and realized how, how poorly that water is painted. But, you know, it was, uh, it was my best effort at the time for sure. And uh, so there's a little bit of a gap in between those drawings and when it came to applying for college. When I was in high school, I really actually started to drift away from art. Um, I fell in love with music. Um, and I thought that if there was anything that I wanted to pursue, I would want to be a musician. I would want to either write music or perform or whatever it was. But um, we, you know, I just thought that I wasn't even the best musician in my school. So I just felt like it wasn't going to be a good idea because I know how competitive music can be. And um, so I, I ended up applying to art school, not because I necessarily wanted to, but because I felt like it was the best choice for me, which sounds strange to say that art school is kind of like a plan B, but that's really what it was for me. And so here are some of those drawings that I submitted in my, my college application portfolio. And um, yeah, uh, my, my, my impression of how I felt about art in high school was that it's something that I happen to be, have some ability in, I guess we'll call it, uh, but I didn't necessarily enjoy it for whatever reason. Uh, maybe I didn't have some you know, role models or I didn't have you know, examples to look up to or people like James Gurney directly in my life who, who you know, showed me what the possibilities with illustration were. Because for me, a lot of the art that I had been making was studies, copies of masters and still lives and things like that. And that's not necessarily the most uh, you know, exciting thing to be drawing or painting. But nonetheless, I did apply and I got into a couple of schools, including, of course, Syracuse University. Um, given my uncertainty with my uh, desire to be an artist, um, part of the reason I chose to go to Syracuse was because I knew that if it was something that I didn't want to do, I could, you know, theoretically change my career. And so that was uh, a big part of the calculus that went into deciding to go to Syracuse. But of course, I also looked up some of the faculty that were there and I was really impressed with what I was seeing. So if there was, if there were any teachers that could influence me or steer me towards illustration and, and um, you know, make that, uh, you know, compel me, I guess, then it would be these people. And so college, I went from, uh, I attended from 2007 to 2011. Here's a photo of my senior studio, uh, which was on the fourth floor. Um, I don't know if that's still where they are today, but uh, I was on the senior side of the studio where the door is. So if anyone sits there, uh, that was my old spot. So, so here's some of the work that I did in college, uh, sophomore and junior year. Some of you might recognize this. This is the, um, what do you call it? The security thing right outside of the Schaefer Art Building. Um, so there was this old lady who was always there at night and uh, I just snapped a photo of her and this was for one of my classes. And this was an acrylic painting some more early work sophomore and junior junior year uh, i don't remember what the assignment for this one was but this one was for the lion and the mouse so aesop's fables and i remember being very very proud with the way i handled the foliage but um anyways junior year i also did a, a an extensive series of portraits i think i must have done about a dozen of these but here are here are just two of them and this was my first, my early attempts at learning how to oil paint. My, you know, I, I, I did take oil painting lessons in like middle school and throughout high school. But, you know, I don't necessarily think I learned a whole lot from those experiences. And so even in college, I felt like I was really learning how to oil paint just from zero, essentially. And so here's me experimenting. I'm trying... 
I heard somebody say, "Yo, oh, paint with turpentine and paint very loose. And so here's me trying that out. Here's some more illustration projects. Uh, the far left, that's for the Syracuse poster project illustration, uh, which I believe is from senior year. And this was an assignment for advanced illustration. So really doing crazy things, especially in, in college. Like, um, you know, I had no sense of, of you know, I, I just, wanted to paint the most dynamic and the most difficult things imaginable, I guess. And so, you know, uh, my work doesn't look anything like this anymore, but it's just interesting to kind of revisit this. Uh, this is my, um, my classmate, Pat, who posed for me and he sat next to me in my studio, right next to me. And here's uh, my second published illustration. This was my senior year and I, uh, like, a. A video game website asked me to do an illustration for The Legend of Zelda. And so this was technically my first published illustration. Although again, I didn't get paid for it. So maybe it wasn't quite my first job. But you know, I was just trying to find my way as a painter. I was trying to find what my interests were um, and kind of stumbling my way through it. And I would say really pushing myself in terms of the scope of the type of illustration I was trying to do. Um, not really what I would do these days, but again, it's just kind of interesting to revisit these pieces. Uh, one of my favorite classes at Syracuse was a class called Drawing for Illustration, which if I'm not mistaken is still around and it's still a figure drawing class. I stumbled into this class my freshman year, second semester. And the, the instructor at the time was a gentleman named Richard Williams. And Richard was my first truly formative instructor that I had at Syracuse. You know, I mentioned that I wasn't quite sure whether or not I wanted to be an illustrator, even though I was going to the school, you know, I got into the program and all that. But it took me a couple of semesters to really wrap my mind around that. And this class in particular really started the process of me actually falling in love with making art. Uh, like I said before, before I did it, you know, because I guess I was good at it to some extent, but that, that passion for it wasn't there. And this was the first time that I, I really experienced that Richard was, an amazing professor. He, he constantly challenged me. He could tell when I had gotten too comfortable. And so he would take my pencil out of my hand and put a ballpoint pen in and say, draw with this. Now he would take the ballpoint pen out and he would give me oil paints. He would take the oil paints out and he would give me watercolor and so on and so forth. And he, it just instilled in me this, this motivation and desire to always try new things and to you know really st start taking seriously what it meant to try to improve as an artist um you know i think a lot of us can probably relate to this but as an artist you know in a general setting you know it's it's pretty easy to be the best drawer in a random group of people and so a lot of people, they'll take that, they'll be okay with that and they'll settle with that and you know, be content. I was probably the very, very similar for many years until Richard started pushing me and saying, no, you can, you can do better, you can be better, you can try different things. And so this was a really, really important moment in my college career. I love this class so much that I ended up taking it uh, seven times so freshman year both and every single semester after that um i was monitoring it and richard just kind of let me hang out in class and draw and paint so i didn't take it, take it seven times but i was there a lot um so um so there's a there's a lot of stuff that happens to, that happened to me in the immediate months um, post graduation, 
And, you know, looking back on those immediate first few months, those were very, very important. Uh, that, that was a very important time in my life. I don't know if I would have uh, said as much at the time, but that's how I feel now in retrospect. And I feel like if I had made different decisions in the immediate aftermath of college, then I would be in a very, very different place. Who knows where that would be. Um, the takeaway lesson for me for this next phase of my life is that taking a step is better than taking no step. Um, when you graduate college, you know, a lot of people are, you know, able to get a job and just roll right into the job, maybe take a couple of weeks off and then roll right into the job. And that's great. I didn't have that experience. I didn't have a job lined up. I didn't have an internship lined up after I graduated. And so once I lost the structure of college, I didn't have any direction. I didn't have any sense of direction in which to move. And so what ended up happening was whatever small opportunity, even remotely, mildly presented itself to me, that was the direction that I moved in. Um, I had no sense of what the ramifications were, would be of any decision that I chose to make or not make. I just knew that this was a decision, this was an option that was offered up to me when the alternative was to do nothing. And so if you find yourself in a similar situation, whether immediately after college or any time in your life, you know, I think my, my advice is always to just take a step because if you don't have any other options, a step is better than no step. And so there were many things that happened post-college. Um, the first thing was that about a month after I graduated, I ended up attending a workshop, which many of you might be familiar with. It's called the Illustrator uh, Illustration Masterclass uh, in Massachusetts. And I went to this event and I just remember feeling completely overwhelmed. Um, it's a week long workshop. And um, I had a very, very terrible experience, not because the, the professors, uh, the instructors rather, they're amazing people. So they were very kind and generous. So it was nothing to do with that. It was 100% about my own uh, self doubt that grew from that experience. So basically the illustrators masterclass is a week long workshop where professional artists and amateur artists alike, they gather to, to kind of learn from one another and be in this very nice, uh, you know, encouraging environment for a week. And that was the first exposure that I had really had to professional artists. And that week showed me that my work was very, very not ready. I was not ready. I had graduated with a degree in illustration, but I was just nowhere near ready. And so that was kind of a gigantic wake up call. And I feel like in the aftermath of that, I could have either stopped illustration, realizing that I was nowhere near close enough, or at least kept taking a step and pursuing it as because I didn't have any other option. And so that's what I did. Um, I eventually did get some freelance work and I was able to work for some game companies, some mobile game companies, some bigger game companies. Um, but eventually I ended up taking a quick trip to New York City. This was about September after I graduated, just completely on a whim. Uh, again, I had heard of a possible direction to move in and I having no real other options, I took that step. Uh, this event in New York was called um, Art Out Loud. It took place at the Society of Illustrators. And so I flew across the entire country. I had saved up some money, of course. I flew across the country. I had a, a friend from childhood who was living in New York at the time. And I asked him if I could stay with him. He very kindly said yes. And we went to this event, this one day event. So I spent about $600 to fly across the country to go for a one day event. And um, at that event, I ended up meeting a rep for a bunch of the illustrators whose work I really liked. And I just kind of, I don't know what it was, but I just went up, I introduced myself. I, I you know, I said, I'd love to, um, you know, 
show you my work. And of course, as I said before, my work was not ready. And so he very kindly, politely said, this needs work. Um, and I went to the event and the event was great. A couple of days later, like on the last day before I'm supposed to go back home, leave New York and go back home, I, uh, I just kind of was standing on the sidewalk in New York and thinking like, I should go ask to see if I could, if, if that person has a job that I could maybe have available for me. And it's obviously a gigantic long shot because that's probably very improbable that that would be the case. But my thinking was, I don't have any other options. This is literally, you know, the only possible choice that I could make right now. And so my choices are make this crazy choice or make no choice. And at the very, you know, at the very most, I guess, this person would think I'm crazy and never see me ever again. He would never ever see me ever again in my entire life. And what, what do I have to lose, right? And so I called, I walk up to the office and I knock on the door, completely out of the blue, by the way. And I just got to get to talking with him, ask him if he has a job. And of course he doesn't, he doesn't have a job, but he says, but I do have an internship for you. And so if you could move to New York by January of the following year, January of 2012, then I'd be happy to take you on it as an intern. And again, I didn't have any choices. So I said, I leapt at it. I said, yes, of course. So I ended up moving to New York City for an unpaid internship. I had money saved up. So I had some uh, runway, so to speak, before I ran out of money. But of course, New York is a very, very expensive city. And so for that first year, I was working at that internship. I also picked up some work at the Society of Illustrators in New York. I lived on the Upper West Side uh, across the street from Columbia University. Um, where it's a little bit cheaper. Uh, the, the rent was cheaper than in most parts of Manhattan. But I just knew that the reason I ultimately moved to New York was because I wanted to be close to illustration and arts. You know, where I'm from in California, there didn't seem to be a lot of it. At least that was my impression at the time. Turns out I'm wrong. There's a lot of it out here. But the type of illustration that I was really interested in was based in New York. Um, a lot of the illustrators are East Coast based. Um, you know, there's the Met Museum, there's the Natural History Museum, which are two of my favorite museums in the world. But again, I just wanted to be close. I wasn't good enough to actually participate, but I thought that perhaps by being close enough that some opportunity could present itself down the line. And so I did what I had to do. I moved there. And I started digging into my savings, picking up some work here or there to kind of stem the bleeding. And that's, that's how my first year in New York was. When I was interning at the Society of Illustrators, I got to see up close and personal and handle original artwork, uh, including artwork by Bernie Fuchs, David Grove, and Drew Struzan. Now I had heard of these artists before um, in college, but for some reason, it didn't really click with me until I saw their work in person. And so I love the energy of their work, the, the mark making that we're seeing here, the incredibly strong shape language. And so I started to try to mimic that um, and, and find my own way of drawing like that. Um, by the way, these are drawings that were created at the Society of Illustrators. They have a weekly figure drawing uh, event. And um, it's, it's a very suboptimal environment to, to learn how to draw and paint because unlike in most environments with a figure, you have one light source or maybe two. This room had like 20 overhead lights. And so they were casting shadows all over the place. And so if you really wanna learn how to draw from an objective standpoint, Go to the Society of Illustrators and it will, it will train you to trust your eyes. Okay. Um, all this time though, while I was, you know, living in New York, scraping by, you know, working at internships, working in these odd jobs, I was trying to create and improve my work. 
So here's one of my early uh, post-college illustrations. Um, and I was trying to, sorry, do we have a question? Oh. Uh, go ahead, I think it was just a blip. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no problem. And so I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what it is that I wanna do with my work. I'm still trying to improve here. And so this is my, one of my first post-college illustrations here. Here's another one. Um, this is me on the ground about to get shot in the face. And that's how that first year in New York felt. Like every day was just me getting shot in the face. That's how tough it was. And uh, as I was, while I was interning for that, that rep, uh, he did give me some spec work, meaning not paid work, but work if based on uh, if it was good enough, then it would be published and therefore I would get paid. Unfortunately, that never ended up happening, but I really used that as a strong motivator to try to really push and improve my work um, to, to new heights and to see if I can try different things here. So this was for like a, a series of novels that would be a wraparound. And so this is like the spine illustration. So you would take each book out and it would be a piece of the, the image. And so this is some of the work that I was making, some portraits, you know, I was trying to really push my ability to render and paint. So if you think back to those loose portrait paintings that I showed earlier, this was about a year later. And so, you know, I do feel like I made a tremendous amount of progress in a very, very short amount of time. And a large part of that was because of that experience at that workshop where I just got, you know, schooled that whole week. And I realized how far behind I was. And if I wasn't going to pick up the pace now, then I wasn't ever going to do it. And so I just started working like crazy. I started painting like crazy, started trying to push my ability every single day. Sometimes I failed and sometimes I was a little bit more successful than not. But these were these paintings, and I have a bunch of these, by the way, these paintings were what I call proving ground paintings. Uh, if I have really great photo reference, how good of a quality of painting am I able to make? And it turns out that I could make way better paintings with great photo reference than without it. And so that was an important lesson that I learned at that time. It doesn't matter how great your doubt is as long as your persistence is greater. There were many, many times in that first year post-college where I had a lot of doubts. Like I mentioned that workshop, that was about the biggest one. And there are many smaller instances of that throughout. I mean, doubt is something that artists, we as artists are always gonna have to deal with. But the reason you persist is because that that inclination is greater than however great your doubt seems to you. And so that's something that I try to remember all the time is no matter how bad I feel about my work or about a mistake that I made in my work or whatever it is, you know, if I can endure it, then that's, you know, that's saying something. Uh, along the way, I encountered many unexpected tangents. Um, and so here are my, my, here's a foray into art direction and my first uh, illustration jobs. Um, so this is about 2012 to 2017. So a year after I graduated to just a couple of years ago. So I spoke about taking chances, right? So leap at the first sign of opportunity. Um, and this is something that I try to keep in mind still to this day. If an opportunity presents itself, no matter how small or insignificant it might seem, if it seems like a better option than what I have currently available to me, then I'm going to jump at it. And one of those opportunities for me was being able to work at Scientific American. I, uh, I was working at the, the internship with that rep and one day, Basically, you know, I'd moved to New York in early 2012. And by the end of 2012, I was really running out of money. Um, it had gotten to the point where I was starting to live off of my credit card and not really having a way to, to pay it off. But I distinctly remember literally spending my last dollar. Um, and so that's like a memory that's kind of seared in my mind. 
but you know, right at the last minute, the last possible minute, my boss comes up to me and says, one of our clients is actually looking for somebody to, to do uh, design work, graphic design work. And, you know, he was basically saying, you know, it's a bit of a stretch, but do you think that this is something that you could do? And of course, here it is again, right? Here's an opportunity presenting itself. And I said, yes. Did I know how to do graphic design or specifically what this person was asking for? Of course not. I had no idea. Um, but, but I said, yes. And I said, and I said to myself, I have to learn this thing now. And so I had about a week to learn what people go to school for four years to learn, which is graphic design, user interface design, and so on and so forth. And that week was very long. I didn't sleep much. Uh, I didn't see anybody. I didn't do anything. It was just building a portfolio that could look passable. And, uh, and so we, we ended up meeting up and fortunately I ended up by some miracle, I ended up getting the job. Um, I still don't know quite how that happened, but it did. And I'm very, very grateful for that experience. Um, this was clearly something that I didn't deserve at all. I had no skill in it. I had no prior experience of it. And so this was something that just completely landed in my lap and I just, and I, I don't, you know, um, uh, deny that it was a complete dumb luck on, on the part of the universe. And so this is the type of work that I was doing at Scientific American. I was doing interior design spreads. And this obviously looks very, very different from what I do as an artist. But this is where I was, this is what I was doing. And I was learning subconsciously. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was learning quite a lot about, about layouts and composition and design from this experience. Uh, as an art director, I got to actually hire illustrators. This was my, by far my favorite part of the job was that, you know, I was trying to be an illustrator, um, but I got to actually work with them and pay them and see how they worked. And so here are some of my favorite illustrator illustrations um, from this, this time in my life. Um, and the best thing about working with illustrators was that I got to learn how to be an illustrator without actually being an illustrator, if that makes sense. I got to observe them. I got to see how they wrote their emails. I got to see how they sent their invoices. And I got, I got to see how they, you know, um, didn't perform well or how they made mistakes. And I learned from that and every positive experience I said, remember that. And every negative experience, for example, when an illustrator once called me and, you know, cursed me out, I logged that in my brain and said, don't ever do that. That is, you know, something that you never do. And on the flip side, if this person did something that I appreciate that, remember that because I, as a client appreciated it. So therefore, if I do it for somebody else, they also will. And so I got to learn every skill, every, you know, major skill about being uh, an illustrator by just vicariously soaking it all up. And by the time I actually did switch over to illustration full time, I haven't really made too many of these kinds of mistakes, at least I don't think, you know, because I had already experienced it. So here are some of my favorite illustrations. Um, here are some more and here are some more here. Now, I think now what's interesting about these particular selection of illustrations is that the reason that they are my favorite is because they, they, most of them deal with a topic of consciousness. And if you try to ask somebody to illustrate any, uh, a subject like consciousness, you know, you're going to get some pretty crazy results. I mean, what is consciousness? How do you possibly illustrate that and convey that in an image? And so these types of illustrations that I got to see an artist work through, I got to see how they thought in terms of conceptual thinking and how to convey an image through, or how to con convey an idea through metaphor, visual metaphors. 
And this was something that I had not really thought about before. If you kind of think back to my earlier paintings that I was showing, they're all narrative. They're all things that are happening, but I never really thought about how do I depict an idea? And I was learning from this. And these are, and I choose these ones in particular because they felt in a lot of ways, they felt very, very hard one, especially this one right here. This was a very, very hard one illustration and we worked our way through it and we ended up coming up with a great end result. So I'm very, very proud of these particular ones. So my first freelance gig, my first real freelance gig, I should say, came in 2013. So this is two years after I graduated and this is what I made. That was my first paid job. I got paid $660. It was for Scientific American, uh, you know, the magazine that I was working at and my boss, Michael Marak, the one who hired me, he was extremely gracious. He not only gave me the job, of course, but he also fed me illustration work from time to time. And I got to learn what that experience was like in a very safe environment. Um, and, you know, this one in particular, I remember like, it's my first illustration. I'm going to do a, an oil painting. And I just, you know, I, 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 I admittedly like I kind of ended up not it ended up not coming out as well as I thought so I ended up finishing it in Photoshop but it's just kind of funny in retrospect how determined I was but this was my first one you know nothing spectacular but you don't get to choose your first illustration project it kind of chooses you here are some other editorial illustrations that I made for other clients uh and some scientific American pieces here uh this one was for Vice I don't remember who this one was for uh, this one right here was for Scientific American, and this was my first piece that got into the Society of Illustrators annual show. Uh, what's funny about this one is that um, you can clearly tell that this is different work than what I'm what I was doing before, and so I'm really going in a different direction. And when I was submitting to shows, I was not submitting this work because. I think deep down, I knew that I wasn't really trying to do this kind of work, but I was doing it just for the sake of getting illustration reps, you know, under my belt. But this one uh, has a funny story because when I submitted to the Society of Illustrators that year, I submitted a bunch of those, you know, oil paintings, like the ones I showed you before. And right before I'm about to hit submit, I said, you know what, I should also include this one because I think they'll like it. And this is the only one that ended up getting in. <laughs> And uh, the other ones all got rejected. And so this is when I learned that these annual shows, they have specific tastes and they're looking for specific types of work. And whether you choose to, you know, follow that or whether you choose to kind of go your own way, that's, you know, that's a choice that you have to make. I could have done a lot of this kind of work, but I didn't necessarily want to. But nonetheless, I still learned a great deal from all of these about conceptual thinking again, um, not conveying an illustration in a narrative sense, but how to communicate an idea. And this is, again, something that I not really thought a whole lot about and being exposed to editorial illustration just made me appreciate so many different aspects of illustration. Going back to those previous illustrations here, like. Before, before working with these illustrators, I was only looking at painters. And through working with them and through being exposed to editorial illustration, I really started to open up my eyes in terms of what good illustration was and what it could be. And so in so many ways, that job experience of working at Scientific American was just opened up my mind, opened up my mind to what illustration could be. And so I'm very, very grateful. And I think the way I think to this day uh, is has so much in large part because of that job experience. Here are some more uh, pieces for Scientific American. I'm going back to the oil painting with these ones. And here's another one. Um, this was for like, a, there's a ancient civilization, ancient city in, um, in Mexico. And uh, I got to actually talk to an archaeologist who was, you know, living on this site and um, got their feedback and whatnot. And so that was a fun experience. This was one of my first 
you know, major illustrations. A closed door is just as good as an open door. Um, during this time, as I was working as an art director, the thought of perhaps pursuing art direction and not really going down the path of illustrator was something that I thought about a lot. Uh, and in some cases, I actively tried to go down that art direction path. Um, and so for a couple of years, I actually did try to move up the corporate ladder. I tried to apply to different companies. I tried to, you know, look up different opportunities in other cities and whatnot. And I even got so far as like, you know, going far in the interview process with major companies like Google, the New York Times, Rockstar Games, uh, a couple of other ones, but all of these companies rejected me. And at the time I was extremely disappointed. I was, because I just, you know, uh, that's for some reason, that's what I wanted to do. At least that's what I thought I wanted to do. And it was a very, very disappointing time of my life. Um, I was still not really getting a lot of work as an illustrator. And so I thought, this is just too tough. I've got to pursue other options. I'm a couple of years out of school, you know, time to buckle down and make some decisions. And so I said, maybe I'll go down the art director path. But those doors, unlike before earlier on in my career, where there were some doors that opened up, they weren't opening up for me anymore. And in retrospect, now that I'm looking back on it, if I if one of those doors had been open, if one of those jobs had interviews had gone through, I would still be there to this day, probably. And I wouldn't be an illustrator. And so I'm very grateful that those doors didn't open. And so in the in the moments, a closed door feels terrible. But, you know, in retrospect, it it's, it's, it's the right, you know, way for it to be. Here are some of those illustrations that I was creating during those time during that time again. And just pushing myself with my storytelling ability with my painting ability. Um, and trying to make things up, trying to focus a little bit more on history and fantasy. And this particular piece is what I consider to be sort of an aha moment for me. Um, this was the first piece in my portfolio where I really started to combine my experience as a graphic designer with illustration. And so this is a very straightforward, simple composition but I'm also trying to uh, infuse this painting with some conceptual thinking and some ideas, not narratives, but trying to make it more about symbolism. And I wouldn't have made this piece if it wasn't for my experiences working at Scientific American, if I hadn't been exposed to different ways of thinking. Uh, and so this is one of those paintings that I still keep in my portfolio um and it's a reminder to me to just kind of think differently you are an illustrator because you say you are not because of any official job title high profile client or award this is something that i struggled with for many many years um unlike with other fields you know once you graduate and you get a job at a company doing this or that your job title confirms that that's what you do. Or perhaps you, you know, your field requires you to get a particular degree in order to be qualified to do something. And so your degree and your job, you know, are those confirmation tools that say you are this. With illustration, yes, of course we get an illustration degree, but that's not really the way it feels. Um, and so, like I mentioned before, I was struggling to really identify with being an illustrator. I was, I would, I would go around introducing myself first and foremost as an art director, actually. And I would say, I do illustration on the side. And so illustration didn't seem like a real thing to me, at least not, you know, on a gut level. And it took me a lot of, a long time to really come around to actually being comfortable with calling myself an illustrator. Um, basically all the way up until 2017, which is six years post-graduation. 
Um, you know, as I mentioned, I tried to leave illustration. I actively tried, but those doors were closed to me. And so I'm glad that they were. Um, so here's uh, what I've been up to in the last few years from 2017 to now. And so it's when people ask me how long I've been an illustrator, I do kind of struggle to, uh, you know, give an honest answer to this question because I could theoretically say I've been an illustrator since 2011, but to me, I never made that commitment until 2017. I was sort of halfway in, halfway out, um, trying to make things happen, but 2017 was where I really decided to go down this path. Um, so just a, just a little bit of a kind of what happened in between. Um, In 20, December of 2016, I was home visiting my family for the holidays. And I had a conversation with my mom where I basically said, you know, I'm not quite happy being an art director anymore because I want, I, I transitioned mentally to wanting to be an illustrator, but there was no real kind of clear path on how to make that transition. And so I told my mom in June, six months later, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to pursue illustration illustration. And she was very, very supportive. And I'm super appreciative of that to this day. And so I went back to New York home, you know, refreshed from my trip, uh, from my trip home. And about two weeks after I got back, so this is J January of 2017, uh, I got an email from my boss's boss, which was very unusual because, you know, usually the messages were relayed through my boss, not directly to me like that. Um, but she said, Hey, we're going to have your entire team come in for a brief meeting. And, and so I immediately thought that something was strange and I had an idea of what was going to happen. And so we go into this meeting and they they told us that we're going to get laid off and while of course getting laid off is a very, very sad thing for many people, for me, it was liberating. I was so happy, but of course I couldn't show it because everyone else was disappointed and upset, but I had already made the decision to leave. And now I was going to leave and get severance and unemployment and have a nice, you know, runway to actually start my illustration career. So I really couldn't have asked for a better start to my to my formal illustration career and so here are two of the projects that i've worked on in the past few years these are both for book covers and again thinking about conceptual um uh, conceptual thinking um how to convey an idea through symbology and through metaphors rather than necessarily a strict narrative and this is only a recent development really i again I was mostly focused on narrative illustration, but I was exposed to these new things. And so I'm infusing that very intentionally into my work now. I continue to do work for Scientific American. And so here's uh, one of those projects. Um, this was for a double page spread about what happens with uh, you know, a whale when it dies. And so it floats to the bottom of the ocean. It's a very, very unusual project for me to get, but it ended up being really one of my favorites. And it made me think about design again. It made me think about how do I design a compelling composition that will look good in a layout. Um, and I got to tackle some very, very interesting and unusual um, subject matter through the, these editorial jobs. My primary, my primary interest as an illustrator, as Joanna mentioned before, is historical and, and, and even fantasy in nature. And so having the opportunity to work on these kinds of jobs is really, really fun because it's just completely different. Here's another illustration for a book, fantasy book. And um, Uh, enjoy the process as much as the end result. This is something that I'm still to this day trying to figure out. Um, you know, I'm, I, feel, I feel like I mostly figured it out, but 
you know, most artists, we enjoy, you know, receiving praise at the end of when we share our work and these sorts of things. We enjoy that process. And so, uh, you know, we, we put forth our best effort and to some extent we even like sort of like just mentally kill ourselves to get to that end result. And what I've realized over the years is that you should, you must not forget that the reason you're drawing and painting is because you enjoy the process of making as much as you do looking at the end result. If you enjoy the process, if you learn to fall in love with that, then you will have no problem showing up every single day. You will want to draw and paint. You will love that process. You will move on quickly from one project to the next because you're excited to jump onto the next thing. You won't linger on past accomplishments. You'll look forward because the process of creation is the goal, not the end result. And so here are some of the things that I've been um, working on in the past few years with those particular, uh, I guess, little tidbits in mind, enjoying the process, um, realizing that my doubt is not as great as my persistence, you know, these sorts of things that I was sharing, you know, all of those ideas are actually finding their way into my work. Um, it's not obviously going to be visibly obvious, but to me, it's personally obvious. Um, and my work has been going in different directions. I've been pushing myself, of course, trying to see what I can paint. Um, but at the same time now, I'm really starting to understand the importance of infusing my work with my own personal ideas and my own personal opinions and beliefs and my interests. Um, this is something that I did not think about a whole lot before. I primarily was interested in creating a good end result so that people would be impressed. People would be impressed with my drawing and painting ability. And I realized that that's a very hollow pursuit, that what we are as artists, first and foremost, are not necessarily just craftsmen. We are craftsmen. But what we are, are visual communicators. We are people who communicate ideas, stories, themes through our pictures. And we have to know what it is that we want to communicate. And so this is me trying to really be mindful of that and infuse a little bit of myself into these projects. So while it looks like I'm painting an armored man, you know, standing in front of a golden dragon, you know, what I'm really thinking about is my own cultural upbringing, my own heritage, um, and infusing that into my work and learning more about where it is that I come from. Um, you know, I might be painting a book or painting an illustration about Queen Esther from the Old Testament and designing it with multiple figures in mind and doing all these things and lighting it in this particular way. And that's my, that might be what I'm painting about, but what I'm thinking about are my early influences. So here again comes Lawrence Almatadema, once again, pops up. Uh, and in this case, what I'm doing here is I'm infusing that early influence with a more recent influence, uh, an artist by the name of Edwin Austin Abbey. So I'm combining certain aesthetic elements from this one with perhaps the drama of this one. And so we get this end result. And these are my personal interests coming out and, and um, you know, uh, taking shape. You know, I might be drawing a family of, of explorers um, in trying to solve some mystery or, or whatnot. Or I might be painting a scene about a woman and all these birds flying around her. But what I'm really thinking about still is layout and composition. So these things, these, these experiences that I had been exposed to and that I had been thinking about all my life are now very, um, very intentionally finding their way into my work. 
And so this might not be visible to you in this image, but it is to me because all of those experiences are filtering their way through. Your lived experiences will undoubtedly find their way into your work. Um, many of you are probably not sure yet, or maybe some of you are, and that, that's great if you are. But maybe if you were like me when I was in college, I had no idea what I wanted to draw and paint about. I, again, I was just focused on learning how to draw and paint, push myself like Richard Williams did for me in my freshman year and just focus on the craft aspect of it. And what you will without a doubt find at some point in your life is that those things that are inside of you, those life experiences, they will find their way out into your work. And for me, it was specifically because a lot of people weren't hiring me. A lot of people weren't hiring me in those early years. And so I had to create work that was personal, not because I necessarily wanted to, but because I didn't know what else to paint about. You know, if I wanted to learn something else to paint about, I would have to go read about it and absorb that information. And, you know, that's actually a lot more work than just thinking about what it is your own experiences and your own interests are. And that's what I did. And turns out people like looking at the work that is personal. People like learning about your life experiences. And so these pieces that I've showed you at the end here, they are the ones that seem to get the most, um, you know, recognition and the most uh, interest from people. They, they're curious about them. The, the earlier works that I showed where I was trying to develop my skill, that was me trying to, trying to match what people were doing, trying to be them, trying to emulate them. And of course, I'm still emulating and filtering prior influences, but I'm infusing it with much more of a personal experience. And I didn't intend for people to like that work more, but it just happened to be that that's kind of what happened. And, um, and I think that's a very, very common sentiment among artists. So uh, questions? Hey, uh, we have many. Um, um, what, Leo asks, what would you recommend to students who want a set style but don't know where to start? So you want to have a set style? Oh boy, okay. Yeah, this is a question I get a lot, because especially because I'm a teacher myself. And I think you're going to hear a lot of different opinions on this one, but this is my true thought on this. I think we place way too much of an emphasis on style. And, um, and I don't think it's nearly as important as focusing on the content and the substance of your work. So, you know, the style is just the, the, the gift wrapping around the substance, which is the actual gift. And if your gift wrapping is beautiful, that's great. But if your the substance of your artwork isn't very interesting or meaningful to you or to your viewers, then you're going to end up with very hollow work. Um, you, my style was not necessarily something that I pushed, that I made any very strong decisions towards. It was completely just a natural evolution. And, and uh, you know, people see, people look at a painting that I do and notice that it's a painting that I did uh, from a visual aesthetic perspective because of certain choices that I make. But I don't necessarily, I actually feel like people, other people see my work as more of a, consistent style than I do. Um, and that's, that might be because, you know, I have a much closer, I've been paying much more closer attention to the small subtleties or whatnot, but, uh, yeah, I don't really worry too much about style. Um, but, you know, definitely filter your influences and, um, don't try to force anything. 
that's my best advice. We have many more questions asking for advice. I hope you can. Okay. Um, yep. And you've given us so much, so much tonight also. Um, a lot of students, I guess, would like to know what advice you would give yourself as an undergraduate student in illustration or mm -hmm. looking back, would, are there things that you wish you had done or that you would suggest our students do? Um, well, the question would be like, would I, would I suggest doing anything differently with my college career? Um, you know, like I mentioned, I felt like, I felt like a train had hit me at that workshop after my graduation. That's how bad I felt. And I, I, you know, in the moments and at that moment, I feel like I would have said, I wish I had pushed myself even harder than I did so that I would be better prepared. But in retrospect, I needed that train to hit me because I wouldn't have had that wake up call if I was a little bit more prepared. If I would felt a little bit more sure about myself, I don't know if I would have literally within a month flipped a switch. I mean, the first paintings I made after that workshop were just leaps and bounds better because I just kicked it into high gear. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, really change anything about my collegiate career in that sense. Um, but I guess, you know, on a more, I spent a lot of time after having decided to be an illustrator, still taking other classes. And I guess like I, I do sort of wish I took more, art specific classes once I had decided that this is what I'm going to do um, and to just make more work, um, you know, spend a lot of time in the studio or, I mean, working, I guess, uh, because, you know, college is all about just exposing yourself to different ways of working. I mean, I showed you, I showed you those early paintings in college and how different they are than what I am doing now. And, I did those paintings and realized that's not how I wanted to work. And I found my way to a different style or different aesthetic. Would you recommend that an undergraduate student take that workshop that you did, that you took the um, oh. illustration masters? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I mean, um, especially if you feel pretty clear about what you want to do, but you know, even if you don't, I think it's a great experience. But um, hopefully you'll have a, a little bit more fun than I did. Do you have any advice for um, lining up jobs and internships as an undergraduate student? Um, lining up internships. Uh, it depends on what field as far as the internships go or jobs for that matter. Um, I know that there are a lot of like illustration students who are interested in working in animation and these sorts of fields, which is obviously most of the illustration or animation field is kind of located where I am out here in California. Um, so, you know, going just going based off of my, the way I handled things, like when I graduated, you know, social media and the internet was still very much so the, the thing to do, you know, emailing and these sorts of things. But even in 2011, I knew that it would be a better choice to go in person. And that's why I flew, spent $600 to go to New York for three days for an event, because I knew that that was gonna be a better choice than trying to email people in person. Now, I know for a lot of people that these sorts of things are very cost prohibitive, but wherever you can go to things in person, go to events when events come back, meet people face to face, or, you know, no matter how amazing technology gets, that experience will never, you know, be replaced by technology. And I still feel that way today as I did in 2011. Um, I'm going to stay one more question about undergraduate. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations or advice to pre prepare for that professional um, world after graduation? Um, 
Well, let me go ahead and uh, give you a, uh, I do have one more slide here and I'll go ahead and just pull this up right now. This is personally my biggest <laughs> quote that I tell myself. And it's that this is a job. Show up Monday through Friday, 40 hours a week and take weekends off. And you know, I don't mean to say like, take this so literally as in, you know, work nine to five. Like I do work 40 hours a week. And I think, you know, when you graduate, I had this feeling of I'm not a professional yet because I wasn't getting jobs, because I wasn't, you know, quote unquote, good enough to get work. Um, and I wasn't getting the recognition that I think a professional should be getting. What I didn't realize at the time is that a professional is simply somebody who works at it and shows up every day. This is, you know, I, I sort of cringe when people call art like a calling. I know, you know, not that I don't necessarily believe that or whatnot. Um, I just feel like if you refer, if you think of this as being a job where you have a skill that somebody will be paying you for that skill or that service, then, you know, it's going to, it's going to keep you grounded when you feel really good about yourself. And it's also going to remind you that you don't necessarily deserve better treatment when things aren't going well. So it, it's a good way to keep you grounded. So if you are trying to, if my biggest advice in terms of entering the professional workforce is to think of yourself and treat yourself like a professional. And the best way to do that is to put in the work. Um, you know, don't, don't wait to start working until somebody hires you. Um, some, nobody will hire you. Nobody should hire you if you aren't first showing the necessary amount of commitment that it requires. Um, that's great. Thanks. Do you have any, um, could you talk about how you pace yourself for deadlines? I guess kind of how do you, um, approach that work, right? Doing I take work. on, I take on yeah. everything that I can that interests me. And I, sometimes it's way too much, but it's the same mindset of, you know, um, like when I, when I was, interviewing for that job and I had to learn a new skill in a week. I just, you have, you do whatever it takes to make it happen. So, you know, I don't really think too much about pacing it out. Uh, I've definitely asked for more time on projects to make it fit a particular workload that I have. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, um, I have enough experience to know how long something will take. So if I work on a long piece, it'll take me about two or maybe even three weeks. But usually I can tell from the, the brief that a client sends me that this is going to be something that I'm going to be painting for about seven to 10 days or, or whatever it might be. So, but uh, until you reach that level of awareness about your own process, take on all the jobs and then figure out a way to make it happen. That's my best advice. Um, we have a couple of questions about figure drawing. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you have any tips um, about the process of perfecting that figure drawing skill um, mm -hmm. that involves improving and learning? Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, yeah, figure drawing is probably the single most important thing that I do on a regular basis that, that pushes me. Um, I actually just did a demo for my students yesterday and I told them at the end of it, the amount of work and thought about color theory and value and blending that I put into this, this exercise here is actually way more than what I do on my illustration projects. And so the, the sophistication of color and value is greater in the study than, than it, it, it usually ends up being in my finals because the studies I'm really trying to push to new heights. And 
you know, when I'm doing my illustration work, hopefully some of that will trickle down and actually find its way into that work. As far as like, you know, actual tips, um, my approach to figure drawing is to, is to just, um, I, I know a lot of people say like, think about anatomy as like the main entry point, but I actually have a different approach, which is anatomy is the secondary element. And you want to actually think of your eye as a camera. Your eye is a camera and um, your brain gets in the way of being able to observe objectively. And so a lot of times people struggle with drawing hands or eyes or, you know, noses because you're not drawing what you're seeing. You're drawing a symbol of the thing that you're observing. So, you know, that's why we get those, you know, uh, almond shaped eyes or sausage fingers. And that's because we're drawing our assumption of a hand or our assumption of an eye rather than what we're actually seeing. I always tell my students like, how is it that a camera that has no brain is able to capture something more convincingly than we are? We ha don't we have the same, you know, hardware that a camera and a printer does? So what is it that is the difference? And the difference is our brain. Our brain is getting in the way. So the more you can learn to shut your brain off and just trust what your eyes are seeing, you know, things like shape language and, uh, you know, proportions and these sorts of things, those will start to become more, uh, more and more evident to you as you really start to focus on those things. Great. Um, some students uh, wanted to know more about whether your music interests ever, um, if you ever found ways to connect that to your illustration work or mm -hmm. were inspired yeah. in any way with music yep. or how that translates into some of your visual work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I so what the great question because the answer is 100% yes. And maybe not in ways that, you know, some people would assume actually. I um so I'm going to speak a little bit about music theory here, so I'm sure, you know, some people might be aware, some people might not be, so just bear with me a little bit. But I learned everything I know about color theory from having learned aspects of music theory. So in music theory, there's a concept called transposition where a song is written in with a particular interval structure in mind, but you can write the song in any key as long as those intervals are the same, you can actually move the, the key up or down, right? So it'll change, the structure is the same, but just based on where the first note is, it kind of shifts it up or down. And when I, I knew that way better than I did color theory. And so the way it actually translated was those intervals that I was talking about with music, that is the value structure of a painting. And you can put any color, you can put that value structure in any key. And so you can go warmer or you can go cooler. As long as those intervals are the same, you can shift and apply any colors you want uh, on top of that structure. And so that's how I correlate something I learned and understood way more clearly in something completely different to what I'm doing now. And, you know, I, I always tell my students, like, you might not have that music training. Maybe you were, you know, into ballet or maybe you were, you're really into cooking or, you are an athlete and you trained a lot, try to find those metaphors because you don't wanna waste all that, that time and training that you put into that thing. There's something useful that you can draw from that experience. And for me, it's music because I, I was obsessed with it and everyone else is gonna have their own um, personal uh, you know, ways to make those connections. That's great. Um, one last question. It's another big one. Um, I, I mean, you talked about a lot of times you faced, you talked about persistence, right? Uh, over mm -hmm. doubt. Uh, do you have any advice or tips for finding inspiration when you've lost it? Uh, yeah. Or, 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, this is like a theory of mine that I've just started thinking about within the past like six months. So it's not really a fully formed idea. So I might in a couple of months renege this, but you know, for the time being, I, I, I think I believe in it, which is that I don't believe in artist block. I don't believe that artist block is a legitimate thing. And the reason I say that is because I think that artist block or what we perceive to be artist block is just our, our fear of putting down a bad idea. Um, especially when you're an illustrator and you are uh, working on thumbnail sketches, right? So we're all familiar with thumbnail sketches. You're trying to put down an idea on paper. Uh, and, you know, I always, I always like to tell people like, don't, you have, it's not that you have no ideas. It's that you have so many, you have so many ideas in your head and the majority of them are bad. And you are just kind of so quickly filtering through them. And you're saying, no, that's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea. And you just keep going. The, and then you re you reach a point where you're so tired of saying that's a bad idea. that you're just like, I don't have any ideas, but you did have ideas. They were just bad. And and so one thing that I've been doing is that no matter how bad the idea is, I put it down on paper and I let it, I let my, my own eyes evaluate whether it's a bad idea or not, rather than killing the idea in my head. Um, I mean, we all understand this notion of like, oh, this experience was, I, I imagined this experience better in my head than it really ended up being. So we've all heard that, right? And we've all experienced that. Well, if that's true, then we can actually have the exact opposite experience. Something can seem worse in our heads than it is in real life. And so if you have a bad idea in your head, then don't kill it, put it down on paper and allow yourself to confirm that it's a bad idea. And most of the time it's gonna be a bad idea and you're fine. So, but you can really quickly generate so many bad ideas. I mean, like, I actually did this exercise where I went out on an hour walk and I said, I'm gonna have a book done by this hour walk. And I did in my head at least, you know, and it, am I, I don't have any writing experience. I'm, I'm sure it would be a bad book, but I had something done. And that just shows you like, we place so many obstacles. And um, if you take those obstacles away, you realize that you do have a lot of, you know, a lot of ideas. And it's just about sifting through all of the bad ones. There's gonna be 10 bad ideas before you get to one that's, that's decent. And that's, that's the way I approach my work now. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. This has been a mm -hmm. really great talk um, to know. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I admire like all the work you've done and that you've just oh, keep growing yeah. as an artist. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I was very honored to speak to you all today. Um, you know, it's, I, I do hope to one day be able to be there in person, but, uh, you know, until then, you know, best of luck to everyone here. And uh, I hope you learned a little bit of something today. So thank you. Yes. And yes, I hope you come back. So that'll be great. We'll see you in person someday. Okay. okay. Thank you everyone. And everyone have a good, a good night. We'll see you next week. All right. Take care, everybody.